And it's absolutely spectacular book, um, Avogadro's Method for Kurimas and the Pedagogy of Space. I never know how to pronounce that word in English. Um, and I've been having, I mean, I bought this book some time ago and I've been having an extraordinarily, just a wonderful time reading it and not just reading it, but kind of um, re reveling, luxuriating in these in these reproductions in such like not just the quality of the reproductions, but the quality of the design, which I've never I hadn't I don't think I've seen something like this before in an academic book published in the last you know several decades. I always feel bad reading this during the working day because I feel like this is something I should be doing in my own time. So really do um, do get a copy of this book. This one is here for for, for demonstrative purposes. Um, and uh, well, Anya will tell us more about the ideas uh, behind the book uh, today, I suppose. So I will introduce uh, Anya first, and then I'll introduce Ines, and then we'll get started. So I'll just do a brief bio, if that's okay. Um, so Anya uh, Bokov uh, is an architect, historian, and educator. Uh, she's a faculty member now at the Cooper Union and the City College of New York. Um, and she's taught at Parsons, Cornell, Yale, uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design, and Marquis, the Moscow Architectural Institute, which of course is one of the successor institutions of, uh, of Kutemas. Um, Anna is now fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in Architecture at Etaka uh, Zurich. Uh, she was a member of the School of Historical Sciences at the IAS in Princeton, uh, and a recipient of the Meadow, Meadow Fellowship, the Vinical Research Grant at Yale, and the Graham Foundation Grant. And this is the, the, the output, I mean, the, the, the kind of modified, I suppose, output of your, of your PhD thesis, right? And we are it's also very uh, lucky to have uh, Ines Weissman with us today, uh, who is the head of the PhD program at the Royal School of Architecture. Oh, sorry, the Royal College of Art, it's called of Architecture. <laughs> there may be in the future, this could be, a, this could be a, an idea for a new institution. Um, just royal. Keep, a, keep a royal, keep a royal, yeah. It's all about keeping everything as royal as possible. Um, and the founding director really, 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 really released some sort of royalist sentence from Deep Man. Um, uh, Ines is the founding director of the Centre for Contemporary and for Documentary Architecture, an interdisciplinary research collective of architectural historians, filmmakers, and digital technologists. And Ines is a, a particularly um, well qualified commentator or respondent for Anya's book. Um, uh, because of one of your, I mean, many of your complications, in particular, uh, dust and data traces of the Bauhaus across 100 years, which is an edited anthology of essays published in uh, in 2019. And there's, I mean, a long uh, um, catalogue of, of, of publications and exhibitions and achievements, which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with already. Uh, but you can familiarise yourself with the with the with the full um, bio on the on the PPD webpage and elsewhere. So thanks very much, Ines and Anya, for joining us today. We'll have like forty five ish minutes of um, of lecture, followed by some commentary and um, and a kind of a lively um, discussion. So over to, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, generous introduction, Michal, and uh, thank you for organizing this event. And actually, it's really hard to believe that we are in person and digital at the same time. It's just the best of both worlds. And it's so wonderful to see Ines. Thank you very much for joining. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, again, thanks for coming. And um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, here. Uh, part of this PPP platform with the, most, the coolest graphics uh, ever for uh, also academic event <laughs> that I've seen, and uh, at least did for advanced studies, with another one at the UCL. So thank you for hosting. Uh, so uh, I'll talk about the book uh, a bit and the making of the book and the structure of the book, but I also want to talk a little bit about uh, myself and where I come from uh, as. A few weeks ago, we actually talked about uh, on the PPD platform uh, about paper architecture, uh, which is a chapter of visionary architectural experimentation uh, during the late Soviet period. And I was too small to be a part of that movement, uh, though in a way uh, I was its product as a student in the experimental children's architecture studio known as Pendas. 
founded by Vladislav Kovachev uh, here in the front uh, in uh, the late uh, mid 70s, and who was in some ways one of the also predecessors of early um, early sort of uh, participants in the big architecture movement. So you might be able to recognize what you did there. Uh, and so in other words, I was trained as an architect starting at around five years old. And this actually was when my interest in pedagogy uh, was I'd say, initiated already. As many years later, I still wonder uh, how was it possible? What kind of forces were there at play when uh, uh, you know, as children, we would prefer to work on a project uh, which would take us hours rather than take an afternoon nap. So that's uh, something that still I wonder about. Interestingly, this is also how Ines and I uh, initially met almost 10 years ago when uh, we were working on uh, research about the dissidents through architecture and thinking of uh, pedagogy as a site of dissent. Here's an article uh, published in the Yale Perspective, which I remember very well, uh, while I uh, was interested in Canada there. Uh, and uh, of course, a uh, book also that followed the architecture and the paradox of the in 2014. So at around 12 years old, my work titled Reflection, produced in uh, the DAS studio, was featured in an exhibition at the Deutsches Architectural Museum and published in the catalog by P. Architektur no Projekte aus der Union, 1989. This happened so quite a long time ago. And uh, of course, it is a great honor to have my book on Futumas be featured among the 10 best architecture books of the year by the Architecture <coughs> Museum Architecture Book Award some 32 years later. And also to be among the most beautiful German books selected this year at the Frankfurt Fair. So here I would like uh, to take a moment and thank the Zurich-based publisher, Park Books, uh, and its chief editor and managing director, Thomas Kramer, and editor, Lisa Schoens, and their wonderful team, and the visionary graphic designers of Bonbon Studio, Valeria Bonin and Diego Bontemani. And I'm incredibly grateful to all of them for taking on this challenging project and creating together a book, which is as much a visual narrative as uh, a textual one as you commented, uh, when the school was shut down in 1930, its massive visual archives were largely sequestered. So on a certain level, the book became the project of reconstructing this missing archive. As such, it exceeded the usual scope of graphic design work, or perhaps this is what the true meaning of design is, to construct from disparate parts a new larger whole. The images that survived were not uh, imperfect or well, not <laughs> perfect to say the least. They are newspaper clippings, torn art images uh, of, of photos, uh, photos of photos of photos, etc. Et so there's a large diversity of different different kinds of things that uh, were put together in by the painstaking way uh, over the course of uh, about well, three years of thinking the book. While many images of student work, not to mention faculty work, uh, of course, are uh, very well known at the time and after the 1930s and uh, 70s and 80s, there's little sense of the work being affiliated with the school produced uh, by a student and, of course, its faculty. On a certain level, this is not just a book about Hutemas, but an attempt to give Hutemas a new life by highlighting both the work of its famous faculty and its still little known students. But rather, I focus on certain aspects of the school. To me, seem most relevant and most objective. In other words, representing the objective method practice of Kutamas. And in particular, I discussed the course graphics conceived by Alexander Pochenko and course space uh, conceived by uh, architects in Kalaradovsky and his colleagues. So here are some of the diagrams and various exercises that I was able to recover and uh, really try to understand and analyze. I was fortunate to have a number of prominent scholars support my work with Putinas over the years, including Christina Clark, Jan Luc Goen, Kurt Foster, Anthony Bidler. Uh, some of them agreed to testify to the significance of Putinas as a missing brick, so to speak, in the history of modernism on uh, the back cover of the book. 
The book has two, two forwards by Kenneth Frampton and by Alexander Laurentiev. The reason for that is to address Futuma's phenomenon simultaneously from the inside and from the outside uh, by, uh, of course, the undisputed authority on modern architecture, the author of the seminal critical history, and by internationally renowned expert uh, on the Russian side, someone who combines the knowledge of the period with the deep personal connection being the grandson of Rochinka and Stepanova. So through, uh, through the book, Threading, is the series of illustrations of the space course. Uh, this is uh, the course that has, in my opinion, enormous historical significance as the first pedagogy to teach modern architecture on a mass scale. And I'll try to decipher what I mean by that because it's a big claim. Uh, when, uh, of course, the field as such was in its nascent stages. And I start with this exercise or form an example of the student work issued in October 1920 at Futimas by Nikolai Ladovsky. And continue through various iterations throughout the years, uh, meaning throughout the decade uh, of 1920s, from uh, abstract exercises to the applied ones, such as this uh, which online production tower, which we'll come back uh, to in a moment. The sequence of images underscores another line of investigation, which I discuss in the book, that of a model as a new kind of phenomenon. A model, of course, was historically used as a representational and uh, also as a working tool in architecture. But I would argue that it was not deployed as uh, this uh, particular, in this particular way, as a, an exploratory design tool. Uh, and that's the way in which uh, it was uh, really used and uh, kind of advanced in Putimas, where a project was first conceived in three dimensions physically and then drawn, uh, both in terms of uh, drawn as a perspective and drawn as plans and sections, so typical orthogonal production, projections using architecture. So this is something that is introduced, I think, in a certain way uh, at Futimas as a pedagogical device. The book uh, is uh, supplemented with several what I call codas. Uh, those are archival documents and period publications that are translated uh, in the book and provide a more immersive picture of Futimas. And over the years, uh, I discovered the rich material uh, that uh, uh, by now, it can, I think, can be easily made into uh, kind of a Futimas Digest, a Futimas Reader, so maybe something someone is interested in uh, working on that. Uh, so I'd like to uh, speak about the book structure now. This is probably my favorite slide of the <laughs> presentation, so you can see the, the architectural bones here. So the book consists of four chapters. And of course, subdivided into four subchapters. <laughs> so it actually happened completely naturally. There was nothing forcing this, it just like emerged like that. And uh, the four chapters, I'll uh, go through them uh, with a little bit of detail. So there is uh, the chapter on the school, institutionalizing the avant garde, laboratory architecture science, pedagogy teaching as experiment, and praxis inventing a universal future. So the first chapter, the school. Uh, focuses on the period between uh, the educational reforms of the just after the uh, revolutionary events of 1918 and the closure of Putimas in 1930, by situating Putimas within Soviet revolutionary culture as well as the larger international context. I define the school's seminal role in constructing a mass industrialized society, and perhaps more importantly, I talk about the role that the school played. Uh, in shaping the aesthetic vision for the new Soviet culture from its mass spectacles to the design of multi-purpose aggregates for communal forms of daily life. The second chapter discusses the school's contribution to the development of modern architecture, in particular by drawing on the scientific and aesthetic theories of its time. I explore the ways in which Futima's faculty attempted to recast architecture as a science based on objective laws that guide, or ostensibly guide the perception and construction of space. I described the origins of the objective or psychoanalytical method and experiments conducted at the psychotechnical laboratory at Futimas in the later 1920s. The third chapter, in the way I would say the core chapter of the book, 
teaching as experiment examines the basic or core curriculum of Hutemas and analyzes its system of exercises. While it considers the foundation program in its entirety from uh, its theoretical incubation at the Institute of, Art uh, of Artistic Culture in Cook to its implementation in the core division or basic division, its primary focus is on Ladovsky's core space and on launching course, course graphics for a reason I already explained. Uh, the fourth chapter uh, basically talks about uh, what happens after the core curriculum, so the advanced studios and diploma studios, and traces the way in which uh, those uh, initial foundational exercises evolve into prototypes for the new society, that is into industrial, architectural, and urban projects. This chapter unpacks the idea of total design and the production of mass culture for the new mode of life across scales from the chair to the city. So, um, finally, appendix, or the last bit of the book, uh, includes uh, the epilogue, explanatory diagrams, glossary, and all the other necessary bits. In the epilogue, I address the question that I think everyone always asks is why Hutemas remains largely unknown by tracing its historiography of the, uh, the historiography of the school through several key moments, uh, such as, for instance, this uh, uh, diagram, uh, famous diagram by the founding director of MoMA uh, in New York, Alfred Barr, Museum of Modern Art, who's, uh, uh, who visited Hutemas several times uh, in, during his stay in Moscow in 1927. Well, Hutemas, of course, is routinely mentioned in the discussions and publications on the avant-garde period, its seminal role within the larger cultural landscape of modernism has not been until now, I would argue, properly or really in-depth investigated. And this is a big question, this is a big claim, and I uh, have to say I'm uh, saying this with uh, with trepidation, especially as, uh, as there's been so many scholars working on the period, uh, both in uh, the former Soviet Union, in Russia uh, as well, and uh, of course in the West. And we actually have one of the I think, most, most uh, foremost uh, researchers on uh, constructivism sitting with us in this room today, which is a huge honor. Thank you, Professor Lauder, for coming. And I am <laughs> hoping that we can continue also have this conversation and you can answer many questions that uh, I have, and I know many of us have uh, better than anyone. So thank you. And of course, your book uh, has talks about, on the, your book on Russian constructivism talks about uh, Hutemas in so many ways. I and mean, it's really, in a way, could be, <laughs> could be the book on Hutemas in, in many respects. And yet, right, it's a book on constructivism. And so, and, and it's interesting because those, those, all those notions are interconnected. And it's interesting to think of like how and, and, and why and, and what happened to the school. But I've been talking to many, uh, uh, people over the years, people who studied uh, with their Spusimant Hutemas descendants, so starting with the with Kipishov, who I showed earlier, but many, many others uh, who were educated still when Hutemas uh, professors and teachers were alive. And they were uh, arguing uh, or saying that, in fact, it was not really discussed at all during even the 70s and even, even later on so certainly not before it was completely telling the topic. So, so I wonder, you know, how and why, and, and there are many theories, in fact, <laughs> there are some explanations that are quite, 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 uh, I think, uh, you know, feasible in explaining this, uh, this phenomena. But uh, of course, we can also make a claim that at its time, during its time, uh, when Futimas was existing, it was uh, hugely influential and uh, it was known. Uh, and in fact, it was maybe even considered uh, as a kind of central incubator, I would argue, of Soviet avant-garde culture, as a kind of uh, not just social, but educational condenser, to use um, Carl's favorite term. <laughs> so, uh, meanwhile, uh, right, so even this kind of cursory look at the period publications, the printed press, both in the Soviet Union and abroad, 
uh, reveals that the school's contribution far exceeded the scope of its pedagogical achievements. And so if we open those magazines, of course, we see the work of Hutumas faculty and students featured in, uh, right, in the ABC, uh, the Tragedies and Bowen, which is, of course, co-edited by Lysitsky, with Emil Wolf and Mark Stam. Uh, we see that same project for the Witch Tower, uh, which is sort of says Ladovsky's studio, where it was yet here, it doesn't say who the student was, uh, in Adolf Benes seminal book, uh, Modern Functional Building. We see dozens of Hutemas projects here in Alistinsky's uh, Ruslan, the construction of architecture in the Soviet Union. Dozens. Uh, we uh, see, of course, many projects, and perhaps probably the biggest event, right, that put the school on the global stage, uh, the International Exhibition on Decorative Arts held in Paris in 1925, where uh, Hutemas projects were published in the catalog design by Rochinka, but also exhibited. Uh, in this enormous, enormous hole, right? Uh, that, uh, and it's, you know, sort of not as well known that, uh, that, that this presence of Kutama student work uh, was here, and yet uh, it is a well known fact that the projects received, the school received the grant prize for student work and testament again to pedagogy that at this moment is only five years old. And if we're not counting the Free State Art Studios. However, uh, the presence of the school, of course, is, is maybe larger, right? We can think of it uh, through also the work of its faculty. So many of you, or all of you know, the Soviet Pavilion, designed for the exhibition by Konstantin Melnikov. Maybe a lesser known fact that he was a teacher of the uh, ran the so called New Academy Studios with the Yagosa from 1921. And of course, Le Corbusier uh, described this structure as the only one worth seeing at the exhibition, perhaps after his, uh, mm -hmm. which, uh, which you know, really is that moment when the uh, Pavilion Mestrino is not just uh, you know, a, an exhibition pavilion, but it's really the beginning of modern architecture, right? At this, at this point, it's one of the very first sort of moments, uh, one of the major events that, that launches it. And uh, we are all are familiar with the Workers Club show designed and built by Alexander Rochenko, who's of course fashion shows and trying to channel today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, he is uh, well known, very well known as an artist, uh, but his pedagogical contribution maybe is not as widely recognized. Uh, still somehow. Meanwhile, he was a professor at Putumas and a very dedicated one, dedicated teacher from 1920 onward, initially in the painting department and later headed the metalworking uh, faculty. Furthermore, I would argue that his own practice and his pedagogy were intrinsically uh, interconnected. And then can I just ask you to return to the previous slide? Please? Of course. Well, <laughs> well, 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 maybe, maybe this one actually is good. Yeah. So, I, I need a pipe. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, watching this practice and teaching, right, uh, are, are, are really, uh, I think there's an amazing feedback loop because he is uh, essentially testing the exercises and the method, uh, the methods on uh, himself first with his own work. So he's that the work is is about this experience that he's producing. So in his artistic practice at the moment, he sought to devise what he called the law of expediency to demonstrate uh, universality. And I quote: "So that one can build out of this identical shapes all kinds of constructions for various systems, types, and applications." So his spatial constructions one of the Kind of large and much larger series, and I describe it. And again, it's something which is very well known his work. Uh, but uh, they were meant to serve as a kind of intermediate work pieces that could be then combined into complex industrial objects. So he's developing this interesting sense of course uh, for his students that then produce this um, sort of a model for an exhibition. And uh, those are models, they're unfortunately not real objects, they're, they're at that time smaller. Nevertheless, uh, the students developing the systems and types and applications and produce a range of constructivist furniture and objects. And uh, 
again, uh, this is something that he calls the amateur of everyday life, not to imagine the living standards for the new mass society. We've actually been reconstructing uh, some of those with uh, students of mine from uh, the Cooper Union, and we'll uh, plan to show some of that work uh, this spring in an exhibition. So it's exciting, and there's definitely already, um, there's already kind of uh, 3D models or animations that you can see how those things actually fold and unfold and become uh, those compact uh, structures and then become those larger, larger objects. So I mentioned uh, Le Corbusier, and uh, he, of course, uh, visited Hutemas uh, also uh, for a number of times, but after a visit in 1928, uh, shown here in Moscow, he described the school in his journal, and I quote, as an extraordinary demonstration of the modern credo, here a new world is being rebuilt out of a mystique which gives rise to pure technique. Of course, uh, this also gives rise to the title of uh, Jean-Luc Cohen's uh, famous book, which is where I quote this from, if you, uh, on, on the Corbusier and his uh, work in, uh, in the Soviet Union. Le Corbusier was not alone in his enthusiasm. So after visiting Putimas several times during his stay in Moscow, uh, Alfred Barr, who I mentioned, the founding director at MoMA, could not have been more impressed by what he saw. Uh, and I quote, we feel as if this were the most important place in the world for us to be, he writes in his diary. We'd rather be here than any place on earth. It's a serious point. Yet he chose not to include the school in his famous diagram, charting the sources and evolution of modern art and architecture published on the dust jacket of the catalog for Cubism Abstract Art in an exhibition held at MoMA in 1936. So one of the key questions, of course, that I'm addressing in, in, the, in, in the book and in my work, are uh, uh, what were the reasons for the submission? And uh, even though the school, of course, is often referred to as the Russian Bauhaus. And uh, well, some of the reasons is uh, inside, in the side of the Soviet Union, the school was labeled formalist, which was a derogatory term used by the Stalinist authorities to describe anything that no longer sort of aligned with the new power vertical. Uh, in the 30s, uh, Putama's archives were sequestered, most eventually perished in different ways. Uh, those that survived uh, actually uh, mostly come to us from private archives that have been painstakingly connected over the years, uh, especially from the 1960s on, by uh, the Soviet scholars, the Russian scholars, uh, such as Sergei Khamenev. Uh, and a uh, number, number of others, also several museums in this regard. I want to thank uh, the Museum of, uh, uh, of uh, Moscow Architectural Institute, uh, which is Marhi and uh, the kind of amazing, amazing team there who've been collecting this material and I'm getting to, to know to know all of them uh, again uh, now for my new project. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's really incredible what they've been able to do and how diligently they are collecting, you know, kind of photo by photo, inch by inch, all of this, uh, all of this history. And of course, the Museum of Architecture, the Chusev Museum in Moscow as well, but uh, also many archives in the, in the States, the Beinecke Library in particular, that allowed me to. Uh, sit for months and work with their incredible archives, in fact, donated by Peter Eisenman um, just a few years before I started uh, there. So, many coincidences. <laughs> so, there were uh, also other reasons for historical omission of, um, uh, of uh, Hutemas over time. So, Barr struggled to make sense of the school and constantly compared it relative to, of course, the Bauhaus, which he visited earlier on his tour. At Hutemas, Barr lamented the lack of information, and I quote, it was annoying, he writes uh, in his uh, diary, uh, that there is no way to find any printed matter about the school, not even a list of professors of courses. Uh, which I would argue was not entirely the case. I think rather it is the result of the language barrier. So he couldn't quite maybe see all the things that were in fact printed. 
uh, projects of the school, uh, as it turned out in my research, were featured actually everywhere. They're featured in practically any, every periodical that was published, especially in the late 20s, around 2026 on until the school shuts down. Uh, and we're not just talking about architecture, we're talking also about culture, and uh, there's always some probably every other issue of, uh, of uh, Soleimian architecture and many, many other magazines uh, feature the projects of Putuma students and of course Putuma faculty, but we're talking specifically students work. So this one is uh, one uh, great example and very important one, the uh, pamphlet on Putuma's architecture designed uh, and cover designed by Amy published in 1927. We'll come back to that in a little bit. The school, according to Barr, and this is important, uh, lacked the organizing genius, uh, in quotes, uh, Gropius, and uh, he even called him uh, a custodian. So, which is interesting because custodian is somebody who, who of course, takes care uh, of you know, the building as well. And uh, indeed, I would argue that was the case. So the faculty body at Futamas was much, much larger than that of the Falcons, uh, counting at least uh, over 200 faculty members at the time. It was, of course, therefore, much more diverse and therefore divided. So uh, it was maybe what we can call today a pluralist institution. The set by the rivalry uh, between the traditionalist uh, faculty and kind of progressive, progressively minded uh, faculty. So as a result, it was difficult to understand and I would argue probably for everyone at, at, the, at the time. <coughs> the question of the chief differences between the two uh, is perhaps best summarized by a dialogue uh, that Barr had with David Stenberg who was the head of the Soviet Art Education Committee uh, as well, and a professor of painting at Hutemas, one of kind of very important figures in, uh, in the school. Stenberg stated that the Bauhaus, and I quote, aimed to develop an individual, whereas the Moscow workshops focused on empowering the masses. So this comment uh, dismissed by Barr and others as, and I quote, superficial and doctrinaire, nevertheless has, in my opinion, far-reaching implications. This is something that is also evident even in those two emblems uh, of the schools, one designed, of course, by Oskar Schlemmer, another one by Alexander Lysny, where we can make out in the Bauhaus emblem an individual, the profile, the person. Uh, and other, uh, we make out the kind of ways of uh, instruments, right? The, the, the kind of ways of uh, reproducing and uh, drafting and um, mechanizing uh, the design production. The communist doctrine on education operated under the assumption that a human being was a blank slate, that anyone, regardless of talent, natural ability, or social status, could, through proper training, become a professional in any sphere of life. And in fact, that's what uh, Futumas very much was about. It was about training people uh, regardless of, uh, of their former, say, training or former education, often with students who would come in and have secondary education, and they would, um, uh, it would certainly not uh, be the case in terms of the sort of kind of talent uh, at the point. So admissions were very, very different. It was based on something else. I don't want to focus on that now, but we can talk about, about admissions process if there is a question later. So the Bauhaus initially was training an artist craftsman. Uh, Futumas, from the beginning, was positioned to fulfill uh, a political mandate to educate the working class masses. Here are students on the demonstration. It was open to everyone according to their abilities and aimed at forming a working community. Both schools differ significantly on the matter of the community size. So uh, let me just show some numbers. Uh, so Hutumas in uh, 24 was around uh, 1,445 students, while of course the Bauhaus uh, counted around the same period about 127 students. So this is a very different operation and very different magnitude. Uh, similarly, there are many departments at the, at the school. We can, we can talk about the structure in a little bit. The artistic training of the hundreds of students, many of whom lacked this kind of basic education was a monumental undertaking. 
yet I would argue is larger significance, lay in creating a new social order in which design education would serve as a key building block for fashioning the mass society. Of course, we have a famous uh, training session uh, class by Albers and a put in a space course for them. There, uh, there are also many similarities between the two schools. There's uh, this idea of student collectives that studied, um, lived and worked together and uh, each of those educational condensers. Both Balfas and Hutimas offered instructions, and I quote, in all the disciplines of practical art, mastering skills in industrial design and production. On the uh, right is the photo of Rochenko's students, uh, producing industrial objects for mass production, like this uh, multifunctional teapot, that uh, became a pot, uh, and um, also it has a spoon, and it has a glass inside it, and also it can be used as a frying pan, and all of this falls into a nice bag, so you can take it and be this uh, modern human nomadic, uh, I guess, and light and without any possessions. Uh, and this is, they're making that right here. So, uh, we also reconstructed this so you can see how this whole thing transforms and comes uh, apart and together. And of course, on the, on the left, we have a, a wonderful, beautiful uh, tea set by uh, Marion Brandt, uh, which essentially does the same thing, but in five distinctly separate pieces. Right? So there's a very different logic as to how, uh, uh, even though both are industrial objects for this new age, uh, there is a different purpose. <laughs> Uh, not just function. It is best illustrated uh, also by the comparison of these two chairs. One, of course, produced by the uh, by the Marcel by Marcel Breuer at the Bauhaus using the high grade uh, inverse of steel. Another one is uh, designed by the Tatian Studio, and it's a telling example of the difference between the two schools. Because of course, Tatian's chair is uh, using uh, bent wood. Uh, that uh, in this case it's not even again it's not even the real thing it is again the model so uh, he wasn't even able to construct the real thing as far as we know maybe it's somewhere and uh, it's not that Tuffman didn't like high grade metal <laughs> but again Tomiki had it so we had to make shift make do with this and in many ways the ideas are are comparable is there's sort of lightness of material there is the fluidity of lines there is the um, so it's bringing this to the way that the seat is working. So functionally, there's a lot of similarities, but uh, technically there are differences. There's also this comparison, which is, uh, of course, the Vasily chair and the chair produced in the Nisitsky studio, which is, and I'll say this is another one, uh, where, where Nisitsky studios are about, all about how you be most compact, as compact as possible, but of course, with uh, Vasily chairs, have all this plastic coating of the as much space as possible. So there's, Different, uh, different logic. Uh, there is the, the field of textiles, which both schools, both schools had textile uh, media in the case of Hutomas, uh, studios department. In case of Hutomas, there is uh, similarities and differences. So of course we have a wonderful uh, tapestry by uh, designed and produced woman by Anne Albers. At Hutomas, the process was difference in a sense that the students would uh, design the patterns and they would be trained in various technical processes of how to produce them. They were actually rather sophisticated, uh, very sophisticated training with, uh, with all sorts of uh, different uh, ways in which uh, the fabric uh, could be treated, colored, and uh, and produced, and then they would actually uh, train at, at factories in the city of Moscow, where they would go and they would have practical training, and they would actually produce those uh, those fabrics there already. So this is a kind of again a larger chapter that I'm happy to discuss at the point, but I found maybe some of the most beautiful uh, examples of uh, fabrics. If you haven't seen them, I encourage you to look at the book and. Uh, there's just uh, this incredible body of work, and it's likely that has been something that's been uh, exhibited lately quite a bit in, uh, in, in Moscow, and there's a lot of uh, scholarship on, on those fabrics, but uh, amazing, amazing material. 
So just to kind of uh, go back a little bit to the structure of the school and uh, not to bore you too much, but uh, I wanted to uh, continue kind of trying to answer uh, this question of uh, Bauhaus and Kutumas' comparison, but also uh, the nature of the school. So the school, in fact, is something that, uh, like the Bauhaus, combines the two different uh, existing, pre-existing schools, one of applied arts and one of uh, sort of more of an academy, uh, although Moscow did not have an academy, it is the academy, but this is as close as the in Moscow. And so the two schools were uh, essentially shut down after the revolution and reconfigured into what was called the Free State Art Studios, which was really, uh, an incredibly interesting uh, assembly of art studios, which was founded in October 1918 in Moscow, and uh, and actually other Russian cities. It was really a network of new art education uh, you know, facilities, and that uh, organization was uh, revolutionary in many respects. Um, one of the ways in which it was revolutionary, is something that I uh, describe in uh, the book. But uh, I'll, uh, second, uh, it actually attempted to create an equal representation of uh, artists from all different fields that existed at this moment in uh, you know, 1910s and uh, have them all uh, you know, run their own studios. So from uh, realism and impressionism to suprematism and futurism. And among the names that we have here are, of course, Tatlin Kandinsky, I'm talking about the, the, the closer to the right, uh, Malevich, Klum, Papova, uh, and, and, and many others uh, who at this point are uh, designated as new professors and they're running, uh, they're being appointed by the students and then they're running uh, in this kind of election process. And uh, this is something that is the program of this or the program of the school and other initiatives that are happening at this moment in uh, the young Soviet, Soviet Russia, not yet Soviet Union, because that's later in 2022, we're celebrating the centennial next year, <laughs> never ending. <laughs> so the, uh, the, this program that was published in uh, this, uh, Kunstblatt, the magazine in uh, 1918 in March, Right in March, uh, the elimination of distinctions between sculpture and plaster paint and sign painter, painter, the elevation of crafts and art, the program by Lunacharsky. That uh, is something that then is being quoted uh, or being received with warmer sympathy uh, uh, by the, uh, of course, uh, the, the Workers' uh, Council for the Art. Uh, for the arts, um, ran by Montgolfers, Bertal, Marx, Bixton, and others in uh, already a little bit before, in January 1919, they received the program and they publish it. And this is something which uh, actually uh, we worked on with uh, Ines, uh, in, uh, and this is published initially, this, this piece in Dust and Data, Traces of the Balkans Across 100 Years, is one of those things which is super interesting. What I'm getting at is, uh, if the program was published in, in March and uh, they received it in January, the, 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 uh, we can all see the similarity of language here in the April manifesto of Gropius. Let us then create a new guild of craftsmen without the class distinctions and race and are the barrier between craftsmen and artists. So the language is actually very much in line with the Lanchowski program. And so it's fair, and I'm not the, the one actually uh, saying this. Or, uh, many German historians uh, who write about this, this moment in uh, the history of Russian Germany when, in fact, uh, it was not only a close collaboration, I would say conversation and alignment of values uh, at, the, at this moment. Uh, and the two schools were, in many ways, really, really interconnected in how they, they, were, they were created. So just to give you a little bit of a taste of this, uh, this is the list of uh, students and faculty and uh, from 1918 for this the Free State Art Studios. And this is a sign-up sheet for Kandinsky Studio, which at this point only had four students, just to tell you how, how sometimes it takes uh, a long time to, to, to kind of 
become popular. <laughs> so, so, uh, so he, of course, was uh, instrumental uh, at this point in creating and conceiving uh, the, uh, the school, but also conceiving, in fact, this entire kind of network of uh, Soviet system uh, on, uh, on of museums, of new museums, of uh, and of course of, of the research institute, which is the Institute of Artistic Culture in Hope, but also in conceiving Putumas then in as a as a kind of feedback from the Bauhaus, which is about a, a school, which is not just in here, it's a little bit of confusing graphs, but it can be helpful in the sense of just thinking about this two kinds of different schools coming together, being uh, first separated and then coming together in a single system. And then what Kandinsky sort of conceives of is a synthetic um, course, the, the core course, which is uh, really bringing Putumas together in just about three years and uh, creates a kind of much more unitary <coughs> system, a synthetic system which unfortunately does not exist for that long, but uh, end of 1930, they take out the four, and uh, the rest is history. So I'm out of time, as opposed to starting. Okay, um, well, uh, in this case, maybe I'll-, I'll uh, You have a few more minutes. A few more minutes, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So we're now we're getting close. Let me, uh, I think I've shown this diagram quite a few times. Uh, this is uh, an approximation of this curriculum. It's by no means, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, speculation. But what it shows is that uh, there, there is some similarities in terms of structure, and then there is uh, also the diploma project, which at uh, Hutemas was not just this kind of structure uh, in, the, in the distance, was not the Crystal Cathedral, but was something that was respected of every single discipline, including architecture, uh, which is, maybe and I'll just talk about it for one second, which is probably the biggest achievement of the Hutemas curriculum with uh, its exercises that are, of course, are featured in this uh, book uh, on architecture. Of and uh, are published, as I said, in a number of different places. So the core research of mine is uh, structuring this curriculum, understanding how it works, how those exercises are uh, kind of being sequenced from, let's say, the, kind of the flat surface through the shallow space into the volumetric form, into the uh, into the cubic form and then finally in the deep space. But one of the things that we uh, are doing uh, currently and did over the last few years, uh, so with my students at the Union, is select a few projects that are kind of in chapter four that are diploma works of Kutumas and um, bring them to the kind of common denominator of, of scales. And there's actually two kinds of scales, uh, of cities and of architecture buildings and uh, look at them a little bit more carefully. And one of the typologies that we look at, of course, is workers clubs here, sorry. And somehow my thing is moving from me. It's probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this I wanted to point out because uh, this is actually a project that's both the past project and the future project, which is something what uh, we uh, mapped as uh, part of the social condenser. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and she apologized before. It's not the kind of talk. <laughs> <Do I? laughs> she apologized before. Oh, she 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 okay. It's not an <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But um, one of the outcomes of Putumas, you know, and where did this pedagogy lead us is, of course, to the social condenser because, uh, and it's not, uh, it's something that is happening simultaneously, of course, with the school. Uh, so those are projects by the faculty. And so, uh, Bolsov and Melnikov, 
but looking at them uh, through this uh, through this lens of one finding at Futimas, I think is very important. Uh, they're also uh, looking at the, at the projects that were, of course, published and well known, but not really conceived of as Futimas projects, uh, you know, first and foremost, even though it's diploma work, uh, of course, by Yanidov, that's uh, published in 1927. And I'll end with this project by by uh, a woman, uh, architect Nidia Kamarova, who I think was, uh, according to her at least, uh, one of the, or the first woman published in this magazine in, in contemporary architecture with her, uh, with her project, uh, uh, her diploma work on Communist International, and she claims that, in fact, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was inspired by her work um, with the Guggenheim. She is somebody who is important because she lived, uh, not only she lived to be 100 years old from spanning the entire century, but she was somebody who spans also with her work uh, the entire kind of period from the Kutimas core training where she was a student in Radovsky studio to a uh, later period in the 1930s when she is a aspirant or, or a candidate in the academy uh, after the shutdown of Kutimas and she's designing this uh, sort of uh, project in a very different spirit, right, in this kind of new uh, Stalinist language. And so it's interesting to look at someone like that and to see how, what happened, what happened after, which is something that I'm also working on uh, now is what happens after. But uh, to complete with this uh, with this chart, which we uh, which we started with, of course, uh, in the bar diagram that I think it should be uh, redrawn in the sense that it should remap uh, Hutamas and also rationalism as the place uh, which also influences modern architecture and geometrical abstract art. So I'll end here and thank you very much. Yeah, also uh, like the atmosphere in the room, so I, um, first of all, congratulations to this fantastic book. It's really, a, um, I mean, actually I have received it. It's not prepared now, but I just, I received it for Christmas. <laughs> and then I considered it, it's red, it has <laughs> everything you expect for Christmas. And I was uh, looking through it, it was my present. And it really, when you flip through the pages, you have both, you appeal to the architectural historian for the, for the, where you present uh, the material, historical material, uh, but also in terms of uh, the graphics. And you really, uh, there's also so much appetite you communicate uh, through this book and putting this, uh, this school together as such. Um, and I think it's appetite for architecture and art. And uh, in that sense, I think I recommend it as a, uh, as a Christmas present. <laughs> and, but also, I think for, for the young generation, I think uh, uh, bar mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, also <laughs> occasions you, you're desperate to find a present. I think it's, a, it's the perfect present also for a young mind. So Thank you yeah. very much. This is a great compliment and, a, and a, also a great compliment to the, to the Park Books and team. So it's great. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, well, thank you. Thank you very I didn't speak to them. <laughs> <laughs> but I really mean it. So I remember this uh, time flipping the first time through the book. But also the heaviness of the book and the size of the book. Um, I mean, it's, it's a pleasure to see it uh, in a way also reproductions uh, so that we can see even the pages of uh, old uh, journals and uh, newspapers you, you could present in this, in this book. But it's also, a, obviously, we have a little bit this um, uh, conversation also over the bars. Mm -hmm. And I think the next size book on the scale is always the uh, Hans-Maria Wingler uh, book uh, on the bar. So the star. Just, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The North so, star. <laughs> so I think I, I think I haven't done it at home yet, but I think I'm going to put both of them together. Maybe the size, or maybe you, you know it's the size yeah, exactly. I, I have the same. A, yeah, I have a few photographs of that already. Okay, I'll put them back together. In Austria and other places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, it, it brings me to um, speak about 
these two books um, and how they come about. So Hans Maria Wingler was actually one of the first uh, art and architecture historians who were in the 60s in West Germany committed to write the history of the school. Uh, he kind of had started with work on Oskar Kokoschka and then got sort of like over the Bauhaus uh, wallpapers, <laughs> a commission he had to write an essay, and then he got somehow into that world and contacted Gropius. And uh, actually, through the support of Gropius, uh, he could actually conceive even of this project to put the archive of the Bauhaus together. In the late 50s, early 1960s, I think the Bauhaus. Um, book comes out in 62. I'm not giving my hand now. <laughs> um, so right. It's in 1962, yeah. Um, so when he publishes it, um, uh, it's also he has actually something very similar. It's uh, he wants to kind of tell the the, pe the pe pedagogy of the school. Um, it's the focus and uh, the uh, the master classes. Um, there's the Weimar chapter is thinner than the Dessau chapter, which is also uh, probably due uh, because of the material he was given. Uh, but when he writes it in uh, 62, it starts also a whole uh, new awakening uh, in post-war uh, Germany um, to actually be interested again in that in that school and also to invite not only not only to think about the school of the professors but also uh, students. Um, sorry, it's a bit long, but I think it's yeah, important yeah, to uh, I think to establish where we are, and that's why I want to see with the so question. You're we're saying we're in 1960s. Exactly. Now we're in 1960s, and I would love at the end of my long explanation, I would love to hear where we are at yeah. the same time in the Soviet Union and how we actually how how the mass comes out mm -hmm. uh, or is being uh, written about. Um, so we have actually uh, Wingler writing this book, but then there are also exhibitions uh, slowly starting slowly. And in East Germany, it's actually really, really complicated to revive the bar. Right? So it's also Kenneth Brampton writes it in the introduction. It's the well-kept secret uh, uh, mass, right? of, uh, of modernism. Uh, on the one hand, because of the Stalinist era, mm -hmm. um, uh, which in, in Germany is obviously the Hitler regime, uh, up until of, uh, after uh, 33. Um, and uh, for the U US, it's this sort of fetishization of the of the Be uh, Bauhaus Dessau, uh, but also what you were explaining wonderfully and also the essay you have written uh, on uh, this diagram that uh, people like Alfred Bauer couldn't put it in for very various reasons, couldn't speak about the history of Moctemas from the position in which they were already in the United States. You couldn't speak about the communist uh, uh, affiliated uh, art school. So we have actually in East Germany, let's say the same uh, situation um, that uh, and for various reasons in post war Germany, it was very difficult to write the history of the Bauhaus. Right. On the one hand, which is hard to imagine now, especially after the year 2019, right? When there were how many has anybody commented how many books? That should be <laughs> this should be a task of a yes, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, for, for me, it was just because we in the context in which we met or invited you to this to this book as well was the hundred years of Weimar. <laughs> Bauhaus, so the hundred years of really 1919, and let's go back to, to that later, but actually it came out of the history of the Bauhaus Colloquia, which was, uh, or like what colleagues actually uh, helped me to understand, um, was it was a very in, important institution in East Germany, starting with 1976, when actually the Bauhaus Dessau was being renovated, one of the kind of uh, counter events or um, adding to, to this renovation was the idea of a conference. 
And so it was for the first time 50 years after the opening of the Bauhaus Dessau in 1976 mm -hmm. that we have actually the renovated uh, building in Dessau, mm -hmm. really fast renovated, like almost like within a year from a ruin to, <laughs> uh, uh, to this project. This was also a kind of a party mm -hmm. decree. Yes, quickly, yes, yes. Uh, and then came the conference. And the conference became actually an institution, I think, an interesting international institution that for the first time uh, was because it was in the in the uh, eastern uh, or the eastern side of the uh, Cold War, had access to also to the Soviet mm -hmm. Union and actually an interest in a school like Utmas. Mm -hmm. We had also people who uh, spoke Russian. We had uh, uh, professors who traveled there, who took students there, actually to the Maki. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was actually also a place, I think, for Western uh, historians, uh, architecture historians, uh, many of them communists <laughs> from the Italian, uh, let's say, um, yeah. say, but to come to uh, to East Germany, especially to Weimar, and it was always connected to also travel to Dessau, um, but the, the kind of Weimar became a place in which you could speak about that school. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, now. Obviously, we have uh, a whole history of uh, being, yeah, it was possible to research it, but it was slow. And I, I wanted to ask you when you think, um, sorry, for me, the history really was, uh, as you mentioned, at the 100 years of the Bauhaus, it was really the, the moment in which you've, uh, the celebration was about reuniting that history, that struggle, right, <laughs> of um, uh, both because it didn't happen in 1989, you know, and uh, with, uh, with the fall of the wall, or with 1990, with the reunification of Germany. Oh, the more the, important that's Yeah, I mean, it, no, but it was also not uh, understood that actually also that kind of history, right, that couldn't be told for a long time, was immediately could be celebrated. So I, that's how I always looked at the hundred years as mm -hmm. the, the, an important event to celebrate that we we can now as a united Germany look at both histories, right? Because yeah. both territories are accessible, archives are open and accessible. So it, it's, it's kind of a different milestone. So I'm so sorry for the long introduction. No, no, <laughs> and I will also keep on to show you. Uh, it's, it's, it's essential to talk about the two schools together because we really can't uh, introduce this and, no, and, and it's the only way to truly understand it today for us because there has been a hundred years during which we, we haven't really looked at this in that way. So to understand the historiography of Bauhaus and to bring the history of the Bauhaus through that lens is essential. Yes. You can't really do that anymore. So I think it's really important. And that's why I think it was so yeah. exciting to, <laughs> to be uh, participating in your project in, in this beautiful book and uh, yeah. talking to you for the others. I yeah. really wanted you in this uh, book, but I'll come to that in a second. So maybe yeah. my question yeah. is really, where do you see, because we had also Christina uh, Lotte, yes. uh, uh, actually leaving <laughs> too early, unfortunately, but she would be one of the figures. And I wanted you to just give me maybe also this overview. Where's maybe the 1976 moment that we had in East Germany or maybe this uh, uh, publications that were crucial and we still sense also the difficulty of speaking about something that couldn't be spoken about for so long. So how would you maybe... Uh, narrate that history of uh, that we get to that big book at the end yeah yeah no it's excellent uh, uh, framework to 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 talk with and, and think uh with and, uh, basically the there are some similar dates so after stalin's <laughs> death in 53 there is a new a new period uh and the new period starts of course with a famous um, decree on changing architectural construction in uh, but it's actually not until I would say uh, the sort of mid '60s that there is a uh, scholarly resurgence of uh, looking into uh, the 2020s, 1920s uh, in the Soviet Union, and uh, I should know exactly when when things start. All I can tell you is let's say the very first scholarship. Scholarly articles on Fukutimas, uh, to my knowledge, comes out in 1968 and it's actually published by historian Ludmila Martz, not uh, sitting on the who comes, who's essential scholar on Fukutimas. Uh, 
well known, who publishes a number of different uh, essays on different figures in Putimas, and of course also begins to bring Putimas to the fore, as I think he is realizing the magnitude of that phenomenon, how many lives it touched and how many people were involved. And so that history uh, comes uh, around sort of early 70s as he starts writing about the school. And he writes in a very methodical way. He publishes uh, you know, in different journals, and there are many journals in the 60s, namely uh, aesthetics, technical aesthetics, uh, decorative arts, uh, series of publications from the History Theory Institute that unfortunately recently threatened to be closed on mm. Soviet, um, Soviet institutions, uh, post-Soviet institutions now that made it through the 30 years and and I think it's really valuable uh, because precisely it is able to trap through its existence, through its scholarly body of work, this history. And I think uh, even though a lot of those institutions could be considered one who would today, I don't think, in my opinion, you know, they should be closed, right? They should just create other ones that are more responsive to the new time, but you can still live institutions like that. It's like imagining, um, imagining uh, you know, this kind of question of the Samarhi, right? That it's, mm -hmm. oh, is this something that uh, you know, is, is too retrograde, too conservative, and therefore you know, should be replaced with something new? Well, it's mm -hmm. like imagining that Paris will all of a sudden close its Ecole de Bazaar, right? I mean, like, like, why? You can do something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're welcome to do something else. Keep the history, you know, let it, let it, uh, everybody, you know, can choose. Mm -hmm. Now, live in the state, you can choose to study academic drawing, or you can choose to study uh, something else. Mm -hmm. It's a really good moment that we'll live in uh, at this point. So, uh, I hope that they will maintain all of those organizations. So the question of the scholarship, so 60s and 70s becomes a very slow period of uh, kind of rediscovery and much of it uh, uh, hangs on also rediscovery of those archives. And Khan Magomedov is the historian who uh, goes in and talks and interviews uh, and records the, um, uh, the, 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 kind of the stories of Kutimas professors and students who are still alive, of course, and many, mm -hmm. many of them are still alive in that moment. And then uh, produces uh, in 91, uh, 91, so not the 60s, and not the 70s, the first comprehensive publication of Kutimas comes out in 91 in French. Right? Uh, and the Russian version comes out later. <laughs> In 95, mm -hmm. the first tome and then the second tome actually mm -hmm. went later. So it's interesting. And the same, I would say, with his seminal book on the pioneers of Soviet architecture, which I think first comes out in German mm -hmm. in 1982, I believe, then very shortly after comes out in 1993, mm -hmm. uh, 1983 in, in English, uh, with, of course, thanks to the efforts of Catherine Cook, who is someone who. Uh, also did a lot for the preservation and uh, scholarship on Putimas and of course Avangard. And uh, she's somebody who's worked right in the mind, starting starting that period and then because fortunate to know her personally because she was also always in the um, present in the, in the various architecture circles of the former Soviet Union. So uh, this is the moment when this is happening. And the book, let's say, on pioneer Soviet architecture translated into, or the Russian version appears again, much, much later, definitely so later, and in a different, in different version, maybe more expanded, but still. Yeah. Right, so it's actually quite late for uh, reasons that are, I think you've described very really well as well, they're kind of mirroring the, the German situation in some ways where it was still the Soviet Union until 91. Yeah. And as much as this formalist label was a product of the Stalinist regime, somehow it had such a lasting echo that it continued throughout. And even somebody like Han Magomedov, who's an incredible scholar, who's um, her sister just died, was a, a very famous literary uh, he did his dissertation not on Putinas, not on avant-garde, but on the traditional architecture of the Stan, 
which is a place that he was from. He so even it's not because because he argued, and I know that because I knew him personally, that he uh, would not be able to defend. The yeah. So, so yeah. this is, I don't know why, yeah. but I uh, just will tell you the kind of the situation, sort of like of what was what was the happening back then. So yeah. there was one could publish in, in those progressive magazines and uh, small small uh, publications, but to do something of that uh, caliber was difficult. Which year? Which is uh, I'm going to do this presentation on Dagestan yeah. do doctoral one. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Gosh, I want to say yeah. late 80s, okay. but it was published mm -hmm. relatively recently. So mm -hmm. the books on Dagestan were published relatively recently. Mm -hmm. I can tell you exactly where the question But I would imagine that yeah, sometime mm -hmm. in the 80s or 90s. Because you mentioned also Catherine Cook. Um, yes. Uh, I also remember, actually, it was one of the articles that drew me to the paper architects. Oh, and yes, so yes. If you have, like, I'm sorry, we're going to come back no, to no, no, no. I, I think it's also sure. yeah. one way of uh, actualizing also the work that's mm -hmm. done here. Yes. And uh, she actually described that situation that uh, the sort of sense of stagnation in Soviet architecture. Uh, yes circles everything looked just like you have to work in the industrial housing production and it all looked dull to architecture students so she described the, the situation in architecture uh, stu uh, uh, schools and uh, within that uh, she made people like uh, Yuri Arakumov uh, uh, appear and it made so much sense they were, she was actually describing that she went to the library and she met who could it have been? Lisinski? Not. <laughs> he would be not. But, he won, so but, she, it, it was in the 80s when she, she said, uh, I have to go back to this article, but uh, she said that actually she spoke to a librarian who gave her a key to a very special room where all the avant garde was. Yes, yes, yes. She would have met Melikov. Yeah. This yeah. might have been Melikov. And she, he was old, and she asked for this name. She just couldn't believe that she met him as a librarian now. And uh, there was always the story about this hidden cupboard yeah, in, yeah, yeah, <laughs> in yes, the architecture yes, yes. library. So it's maybe medical. Um, what an amazing <laughs> story. Right? Um, mm -hmm. But it kind of completely pictured for me um, how students were also interested in the forbidden, right? <laughs> and uh, they kind of very acts, it's where I took it as dissidents, right? Of like the kind of the act of uh, disobeying <coughs> yes. or uh, just trying to find also within the world of stagnation of, uh, you know, when people made vodka from anything, <laughs> where you just had to invent uh, and find the space in which uh, you would kind of uh, practice, could practice creatively uh, uh, the profession of architecture. So you, uh, from that comes actually this paper architecture, but also people like Abba Kumov had very much, uh, it divided a bit in those who were referring back to, let's say the third Rome, this kind of uh, classicism, uh, uh, Tsarist classicism almost, uh, and the other uh, wing uh, really to the constructivists, mm -hmm. yes, sure. of which Avakumov was uh, sort of in the yeah late eighties, probably in um, subverse uh, like um, uh, in circles uh, less uh, seen in public, and then they came out, and that was the beauty also of this publication you had shown, in which your uh, yes, uh, yes, your yes, images yes. are actually <laughs> is such a beautiful <laughs> collision. That's also how I met actually Anya, because <laughs> <Actually, laughs> I was looking for um, the uh, Edas um, school, uh, Ludmila. And, uh, and Vladislav uh, uh, and I was looking for these students because in the book it's only saying uh, a child of six years old. No, yeah. you never had a name or so on it, and uh, I, I have to check it. Um, and at some point I found you, and I was like, trying to sure. yes, <laughs> you were still at Syracuse, I think. That's an interesting also phenomenon in some way, this yeah. sort of childhood education and my ability to you know, treat you know, sort of children in this way is yeah. something that was, I think, very much a problem. Involved. The interesting subversive result of the very formal education um, in the Soviet period and then this incredibly uh, sort of strange and you know, fascinating informal yes. uh, kind of 
bubbles mm -hmm. where one or two could exist, one could wait, one could imagine, and it could live. Yeah, yeah. It's still somehow it's, it's much harder for those things to exist in the world where there's no cold war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the power to let also uh, children design and uh, they could show their exhibitions <laughs> uh, and uh, nobody could contest and say, what is this? What radical material are you producing? These were children designs and uh, drawings. Yeah, it's so, true, it's true. Uh, that was a way so to use uh, Well, that's how I understood that school. And I thought this is really like through uh, these kind of pedag uh, pedagogical projects to enact a sort of dissident mm -hmm. because it forms again a crowd of parents, proud parents <laughs> standing around and communicating and it, it kind of understanding that this is actually inspired also by uh, some like either constructivists or also Western constructivists. It's the next chapter we could talk about. <laughs> Actually, like Zahadid, who were uh, exactly around that time, was also interested in the constructivists, right? Was it very much so? Yeah, this sort of appetite <laughs> is yeah. something that you you will find. And that's actually a question. Yeah. So that's something that's the history that starts here in London yeah. with exactly. Alvin Bayarsky and the A Architectural exactly. Association and. What happened here in, uh, in the 60s and 70s, in some ways, this was the place of garden where all the architects who kind of formed the later 20th century were, were educated. So, of course, with Zaha and Van Fulhas and Pedro uh, uh, was here, <laughs> and, and, uh, and Stephen Hall. Yes. And so, all of the, and all of them are, are, are very aware of that period of the mm -hmm. uh, garden. I think very much through maybe originally through Alvin, but then also after and that's Peter's collection of periodicals is very much a testament to, to this interest and to this mm -hmm. uh, fascination with the period. Yes. And so, the, again, the, the kind of the interesting thing is once you start looking uh, at this period not as something that's a kind of constellation of individual stars, which undoubtedly it is, and undoubtedly Rochin Kolesitsky and Radovsky and uh, Popova and you know, Stepano, they were all stars without a question, but they were also teachers. Mm -hmm. They were part of the school, they were diligently you know, developing curriculums, curricula and, and programs and exercises and you know, doing all of this work. So, and I think it was essential to their practice not something that they did on the side. I and mean, they were really interested in how to create this institution, how to also institutionalize their ideas, right? how to bring them out into this like, massive scale, how to disseminate them, how to standardize them, how to make them into, into objects, into things, into buildings, into cities. And so they, they've done this all literally in the course of these 10 years. Exactly. Much of it is still, you know, we're still kind of uncovering, and much of it was actually never built. That, that continues in some ways to be realized, which is also another very interesting thing, is that in fact the majority of the work is, is in the realm of design, in the project. It's not in the realm of building. Mm -hmm. so, and so all of this is, is sort of imagination. It's a broader part of <laughs> imagination, which is what kind of the fascinating thing also with the kind of, with the studio and the children's uh, designs is that it doesn't really need to be even real physical designs that can exist in this fantasy world and then eventually it will come to fruition. So, yes, or some of it. That's beautiful to think that uh, I mean this sort of the reappraisal or the re discovery, like almost the renaissance <laughs> of of uh, both the mass in the late 70s, uh, 80s uh, is actually something that couldn't be suppressed, right? So it's something that, that happened here uh, because people were like uh, architectural or historians like uh, uh, Catherine Cook uh, mm -hmm. and others uh, who could actually go also as Westerners into archives. I think yes, yes, yes. Was uh, a she, was Jared, um, uh, she was writing about uh, how she was uh, Always intimidated by uh, by libraries in in the Soviet Union, that she kind of she had to kind of just perform and insist in sitting there and uh, and learn her Russian better, and uh, by just by her sheer interest, she would sort of because uh, it wasn't dollars or anything that would help. It was would oh, have no, closed everything. Yeah. It was about <laughs> seeing uh, 
really a, a good student <laughs> of an same. archive. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it's not this is where I wanted to also go to later, but um, that actually all this interest all of a sudden couldn't be suppressed, and so it's also an uh, it speaks also for the magic of the school, right? Of this uh, what has been. Um, uh, produced or experimented with, you know, so that it's so uh, accessible and you feel like, oh, I want to try that out. No? Like, uh, so, um, yes, um, actually the, um, the archive, it's actually, I have a feeling it's almost, we, uh, <laughs> um, we have a, a comprehensive archives through your book. No, 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 exactly. So tell us a bit <laughs> what we're still hard. missing, what's not or couldn't be in the book, because you speak actually about the pedagogy of the <laughs> of the school. Um, but how do you think it's it could also contribute of uh, either opening up to um, other projects, also in in Russia, but also let's say the old Soviet Union. Um, how, how do you think this this book could relate and you speak about new projects you have but yeah. is there let's say or like the is that this kind of hundred years uh, celebration can be sent something or is this like not the right time to no no, no. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good moment to begin and maybe we are so it's interesting we started mm -hmm. uh, by talking about the moment in the 60s and the uh, mm -hmm. book mm -hmm. as the kind of as the initial uh, initial journey to rediscover the Bauhaus, and right. So, if we, in my opinion, this is where more or less we are today. So, I'm saying we're, you know, 50 years. <laughs> when, when, when was it done exactly? <laughs> 60 years later? <laughs> no, but something like that. We're, we're several, decades. Decades. <laughs> several decades. We're several decades. It's hard to say exactly because, of course, there again, there has been a lot of wonderful scholarship and the name mm. that once that I've already described. And there's been so many books on constructivism and on avant-garde. So that's not the question. I think the question is, again, the history of the school, right? So so it's it's uh, if the Bauhaus in Germany itself becomes a movement, right? So this is under the umbrella of, or was under the umbrella of constructivism as a movement. It wasn't, right, we, we sort of, we talk about the school as a movement, mm -hmm. the Bauhaus movement. Here, Futamas is not a movement because constructivism is a movement. So it's just the scholarship mm -hmm. of the school. And as such, uh, I think it has actually a long, a long journey ahead of it. You know? So I see this as the, you know, something that can, you know, begin to also generate uh, and has already, you know, like a generated interest on, uh, you know, you know, new new research and new scholars who are working on the subject. And uh, one thing is that it's not architecture school; it's actually uh, age departments that are all to come together in the school. So that we have, you know, we have painting, graphics, uh, or printing. Right? So this is an enormous, enormous uh, body of work with certainly with graphics. Mm -hmm. So. The reason is, and also with textile, the reason is, is uh, time has been very cruel to three-dimensional objects in the Soviet Union. So both in terms of you know, just the ability to store things was, was, you know, it was very complicated. So they threw out a lot, a lot of things. Things were burnt. Uh, things uh, were disappeared during the evacuation in uh, in 1941. There is just so much uh, drama that uh, this this material, this period, uh, went through. So things that survive tend to be flat, <laughs> dimensional. So as a result, we have textiles, we have we have drawings, printed matter, uh, magazines, uh, and photographs mm -hmm. as a kind of body of work. And so that's actually this a lot, and this is a big part of what formed, formed this. Um, but there is also uh, there are some objects that are that have salon, maybe some ceramics, some sculpture, uh, very little comparatively speaking. But nevertheless, we have. Um, we have uh, architectons are a little bit later and from a different yeah. uh, right from a different place but uh those yes a few of them made it mm -hmm. he, he's, he's a mm -hmm. um so 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 that's kind of one of the one of the big problems here uh, and uh the other issue is that uh, a lot of the there is documentary archive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the 
visual archive was sort of not kept institutional because they, they closed and disseminated. So that existed uh, or initially existed in several institutions, uh, museums like the, the ones I mentioned, and others, also, including Tretikov Gallery and Pushkin Museum, for talking about uh, this kind of paintings and, and graphics. But also, of course, a plethora of private archives. Which are still uh, this, this, there, there, there's so many people, right? Because we're talking about thousands of students, with hundreds of faculty members, their descendants. It's a lot of work. So it's still it's going to take you know decades for all of this to mm -hmm. resurface, and it has been luckily resurfacing uh, already in the show that was held in Moscow last year on the Futi Moscow. So we attempted to collect all the work of students mm -hmm. right not faculty students mm -hmm. uh, and they were just people coming in who would come in to the uh, museum and say well we actually have something we have something we just discovered on the shelf our grandmother kept something and she was a student and we never knew what it was until we just saw that out of Hutemas, this is that you know people didn't you know it was a discovery for for the local mm -hmm. population there so so it's 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 a kind of you know, it will take a long time and hopefully it will take also kind of a recognition on a larger um, scale or maybe a kind of national scale where it will become a subject of pride, like mm -hmm. the Bauhauses mm -hmm. for, you know, for, for the South or Weimar, but also for Germany in general, right? And it becomes a, a kind of a place for, for concentration of culture. And as such, where there is, uh, you know, some resources being allocated right now, it's a kind of project mm -hmm. entirely kind of volunteer and, and, um, and love and interest in the subject. But I think eventually those things are probably starting. So it deserves, I think, a much, much bigger uh, support and interest for many reasons. I mean. So um, it's also the yeah. same moment in which, uh, or when Winger published his big book, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it, and then some exhibitions followed. Yes. And uh, then together with Gropius, he had this idea to have actually a building, an archive in Darmstadt at the yes. beginning, and then the 70s moved into uh, also strategically knowing that this would be like a bit of a, uh, yeah, a controversial, controversial <laughs> move to go uh, to West Berlin, so which is like for East Berlin, like, oops, now they have that. Uh, so reciprocate. Yeah, yeah that was yes. sort of also yeah. Cold War um, arms race, let's say, mm -hmm. of cultures. Um, uh, but, but in the moment they had a building to discuss, people come with, with uh, this inheritance or uh, albums, family albums, and started to donate. And uh, I mean, it went also, it, it had the same sort of interest also in the East, which would be now more of an adventure story, really, to hold these two. Like, where would you get uh, similar uh, material? And, uh, and there was there were also um, uh, commercial ways of getting, let's say, from East Germany. From galleries that were selling actually to the to the archive, and so, I mean it wasn't all like yeah. yeah. No, I can tell you that the only thing that will move this from the probably the, the kind of to the to the point where it will become like a Futimas archive and the center and you know, museum yeah. because there's an office probably an exhibition at the mall. But that will yes. that yeah. move so, to the yeah. next level. We're now doing an exhibition at the Cooper Union, which is. The step, I think, a very important step because the Korean Union is an institution with an incredible, uh, you know, reputation and I think, you know, influence as a school. It's one of the most important architecture schools in, in the city. So it's really uh, fantastic that uh, you know, we're able to do it there. And it's a so the first step, I think, that eventually <laughs> will hopefully graduate to this point. Because if you think about not just student work, because you can't just think about student work, that's not how mm -hmm. obvious mm -hmm. and other sort of on the Bauhaus, right? It's all kind of wrapped into, that's why it's a movement. It's the uh, people like Mahole Maj and uh, you know, mm -hmm. and all the other people play it for all around mm -hmm. Mani Albers now and, <laughs> and, and others uh, who are very much carrying this, right? And so I'll begin to finish right? <laughs> so here. Uh, but if we understand Putamas as a place uh, where, again, all of those stars were, right? And that their work, especially from that period, is something that is a part of the school on, in a way. It's a very different uh, idea. So we look, look at the 
uh, to put us through the work of Yusinski, Lajan, Kowalowski, Popova, and Stanley, etc. Then all of a sudden, it's reconfiguration of the whole avant-garde movement through the lens of education, pedagogy, and, and what were they trying to do really, yeah. um, for the society at large in that way. So, so it's a different, different situation in my opinion. Yeah, and that way, I think it's a it's a fantastic book, a milestone to, on the one hand, to feed back into um, what's going on in in, in Russia and uh, let's say in the what I, I would still call it the former Soviet Union, and uh, also that it feeds back to make more comparison, not only to the Bauhaus but also to other international uh, schools around this time. So yes, it is still. But maybe we should. Oh, yes, 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 I know. We can we just talk about it. I really want to stop you because each of the points were fascinating. <laughs> but, um, Why don't we have another event where we actually do bring Christina? We ask her also. I think questions. we would like to, especially to read this one, anyway, to, to be discovered later. I mean, there must be some questions from the audience, and there are so many inspiring uh, and um, insightful thoughts that have been triggered. Um, so do you do how with your questions? I've got two already, one from Peter, one from Alex, so Peter, you put it on. And the first I'm on the the whole screw, which is that's right, that's very important object, three-dimensional object which did survive. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just to start off, I ordered this a month ago, and again, you know, it's such a gorgeous book. It's amazing. The material is just uh, really eye-opening. And I think this whole story about reception is so interesting, too. I mean, what you guys been, have been talking about, and in that sense of the kind of dynamics of cultural prestige or memory or whatever, which interests me a lot because I'm working on uh, a figure from the Czech avant-garde uh, who sort of also just falls through the cracks in all sorts of ways and there are constant attempts to sort of counteract that and they never quite seem to work. But, but the question I wanted to ask was, you have an enigmatic reference to the admissions process in oh. your talk. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you to elaborate on that. Tell us what, what you didn't tell us. Uh, excellent question. Thank you. I so one of the uh, one of the documentations of that is in the book uh, where I in the first chapter translate the Kute In uh, booklet, and uh, it's essentially an advertisement for the school where they talk about finally this coming together of all the departments and creating kind of this uniform school uh, you know, and, and, and with a program and uh, you know outline for each of the for each of the courses and all that so it's actually kind of the culmination and it's also the end because it's 1929 and right. closing in a year um, and in there they actually talk about the admissions and who it's for and, and the kind of uh, even the kind of stipends that they're paying and all that. So the basic idea is that um, they had a rather elaborate uh, entrance uh, quota, quarters and part of that was, and I think you mentioned social engineering earlier today somehow uh, in the conversation. Awesome. Or maybe I'm mixing this somewhere. You mentioned social engineering. One of your conversations, maybe I was <laughs> listening in. It's been on my mind today. It's been on my mind. Yes. Too, but I'm not surprised. Anyway, so there's a kind of like this this idea of social engineering was very much uh, what the society was doing at this point, and Hutmas as a place of training professionals in those areas was was implementing. So they are accepting uh, certain, right? So it's it's the construction of the classless society, mm -hmm. which which means that you are uh, promoting uh, those of formerly disenfranchised classes, and particularly workers, uh, proletariat, right? Class, class and 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 peasants and descendants of those, and so those individuals could enter without any exam, any fees, anything. So they could just you know come in. And if they needed, if they come in and they don't know how to, you know, I mean I think there is there is even reading advising. So there is a worker, so-called workers faculty or workers department, Rob Fuck, that was provided for I think up to three years or two years. So one could come in without any formal education. 
very basic and would be trained to kind of get to the point where they're entering the higher institution in a few years. And this is all the, the Strapfab training is in itself an incredible uh, chapter. And there should be a book written on that and what they taught there and how did they, because that's really that first part. And that's established already in 1921 there for Futamas, there's a chain, you know, there's an organization established earlier, it's right around the kind of also 1919 or so. But it's right uh, there and they are, they're taking the students who are 16, I think I was 16 years old uh, or, or older, also because there are students coming in from the wars, because this is the period of still the civil war. So there's former soldiers, etc., who are coming in when we're in 21. And so that's when they, and they and they coming in and they're coming in and they can they can take them there for a few years and then they, so it's and the uh, people of different or formally advantaged classes, there's a quota for them mm -hmm. and their entrance exams for them. Right. So one of the accounts I have in the book is of uh, a student who is of this slightly, you know, like I think of clerical descent and he needs to take an exam and he is not able to get into the painting faculty because there's a quota, but he can get into ceramics. So. Mm -hmm. His father says, well, you just get into ceramics and later you can switch. <laughs> so he, talks and he switches and he becomes one of the most important graphic artists in, uh, in uh, Soviet Russia. But there are many stories like that. So just to... Does that, that fact exist in the early years of Putinas? For every... For every yes, university. Yes, right every, here, right? Especially technical yeah. schools, etc. Every, yeah. But also the philosophy, I mean, was there an NBU? Was there a fact like... Of, uh, chemistry or whatever. I would, Sorry, it's not a good question. I would say yes, yeah. uh, but the idea was that it would also allow, uh, which one would allow people to work at the same mm -hmm. time, right? And mm -hmm. they would get uh, you know, certain accommodations, they would get certain you know, stipends, etc. So there's also, there was a kind of mm -hmm. all sorts of advantages provided for people to get higher education. There's some good things. Once again, um, but I jumped in, um, yeah, uh, badly. This is, um, Alex, <coughs> but, um, yeah, thank you so much for that. It's just so much stuff which was so much information. I said so many questions that have been changing every minute as it's going on, but that's what we're um, going to do it every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think. I was interested in, um, so it's like amazing to see to me, it's already statistic that there were 1,500 students, which I just would never ever mm -hmm. expected. And we know about the sort of famous uh, figures who were part of Kutumas, who mentioned you know, that it's the ecological and the etc. But um, how, many, uh, how many staff are we talking about in the like, So, my guy, I was like, which was like, but it's time school, and mm. it turns out it was massive. But, but, but then maybe that was just this sort of <laughs> disproportionate, I uh, bad proportions of staff to students. Um, and then I guess um, what happened, like what grounds did it close down, or what grounds did it close down, and what replaced it, and what happened to that staff, uh, that those staff, did, they, did anything go across? Did they, like, what's, what's this? Yeah, the story continues, and uh, so the the, the school of Huta, so Hutemas actually technically exists from 1920 until 1926, 27, where it's renamed or reformed, in fact, into the institute. So from the from Mas, <laughs> which is a short for Mr. Ski or studios, or actually workshops, really. You know, so it could be two translations. Uh, it uh, is reformed into an institute, Fute In, so higher art and technical institute in 27, and then that's the thing that closes. And I just, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, like myself, would really call it the one, you know, under one umbrella of Futamas, just because it's already complicated. Let's introduce this title, and then we can deal with the later iterations of, the, of, that, of that name, which is a micro one important one, too. So, uh, then it actually uh, is disbanded into several institutions. So if before it was uh, many departments under one umbrella, so it was a synthetic composite 
school. Now it's each one becomes uh, either a separate institution or it joins a separate uh, or we join a separate school. So, so we have uh, architecture, which, which uh, department that is joined with another engineering school and becomes the Institute of Construction and Architecture, which then in 33 is reformed into the Architectural Institute that still exists. Yes, so we were just talking. There is a textile institute, there is polygraphic or graphics institute, there is art institute that eventually, or painting institute, there is a, a sort of silicate, uh, silicate uh, kind of um, well, silicate industries uh, institute that essentially is, um, I would say it's, it's a, what would that be? It would be like the ceramics, where the ceramics yeah. ended up going, right? So, so uh, and, and, and some of them would be reformed right away in the 1930s, and others would be started a bit later in the 40s. So, and some of the faculty would sort of then, some the students would exist in different, in different fashions in between that period. But specifically with architecture, there's actually a continuity. So, the uh, faculty and students would allow to continue inside the architecture institute, architecture and construction institute. Um, many of the faculty continued and many of the students continued. Now what is happening what is interesting is that the students who were trained, uh, like this woman Lydia Kamado, were in Putin was graduates in 1929, later in the early 30s uh, becomes uh, accepted, which is normal, right, uh, into the kind of next level, right, the postgraduate studies, which at this point is a new institution, which is called Academy of Architecture, that was founded in 1933. And uh, that institution or that organization is not just postgraduate kind of research place, but it's a place specifically conceived to retrain the students <laughs> who were trained at Futamas, and that's their mission. And we'll talk about that. So I'm actually working on uh, two projects right now. So one asks the question, well, what happens after Futamas, specifically within architectural field, because it's my area of interest. And I talk about this period in early 1930s, in particular, the sort of 34, when also the group of faculty who's taught the course space continue uh, to teach it, but it's no longer the course space, it's the course of composition, or architectural and spatial composition. And they published a book, a textbook called Elements of Architectural Spatial Composition, 1934, that is actually a very interesting book, which is one of the sort of rare textbooks on design that combines the elements from the space course and also the new, new, new old, uh, uh, I, examples, precedents of uh, of history mm -hmm. uh, of all kinds. So not just classical uh, antiquity, but also history from you know, ancient Egypt and uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, China. So there's kind of really this idea of global heritage as now being a part of the uh, Gothic architecture, being a part of the of the new. Uh, Field of the new of the new vision for what Soviet architecture would be, and so the textbook reflects that and then continues on. So they do that, uh, some of them, but again, not all of them. Some get, um, unfortunately, including Radovsky and let's say Melnikov, get let's say fired, and their careers effectively end. And there are also cases uh, of extreme uh, tragedy, such as, for example, the one with Kultsas and. Putz is a very, uh, you know, incredible figure because he's a student of Putumas, he's a teacher of Putumas, he teaches uh, this course on former Colin, he's incredibly talented, um, talented, uh, not just artist, but talented pedagogue. And he, of course, his works are actually at the Tate, we saw him yesterday there. Uh, he's one of the most ardent supporters of the, of the regime and he gets executed in 1938 and no one knows, his wife doesn't know until 50s what happened to him. So, so stories like that. And, um, but many continue. They, they continue despite uh, the fact that they no longer are allowed to talk about their avant garde past through mm -hmm. that kind of meat grinder. But they continue to teach. And I think 
maybe we can talk about some continuity, perhaps subconsciously, somehow, somehow semi-consciously, that then gives rise to not just paper architecture, but I would say this kind of phenomenon of the Soviet modernism, right? That has been also widely recognized recently on like Instagram accounts, and there is also social wonderful but our books on that uh, with the 60s and 70s, a very interesting kind of formal, very interesting architecture, rich and then kind of explorative, mm -hmm. which I think uh, has to do with uh, you know certain level mm -hmm. of uh, of training, quality of training, but uh, mm -hmm. it's continuous. For me, it's, it's also the moment where, like, I, I mean, the Bauhaus was also known for its internationalism, right? It's oh, international yes. students coming. When they come now to Moscow, how international is it? Or like, let's say national within the Soviet Union. And uh, I think, because now when we speak about, let's say, 70s, 80s modernism in mm -hmm. the Soviet Union, there's so many fantastic examples going around and you say this is maybe connected in some ways i mean it would be so beautiful to also bring these 2000 students back into into also uh, the map of, yes of yes, the soviet yes. union and we can trace specifically uh, many students from different parts of the former soviet union and there's for example uh, a group of students who come from Armenia mm -hmm. and uh, with Alabian and uh, Mazmanian and uh, Kocha and others who are, uh, you know, who have also very different faiths. Uh, Alabian becomes a part of the young uh, kind of protagonists of uh, Volpra, which is the proletarian uh, association of architects, and uh, attacks Ladovsky and all his teachers, and, and then becomes president of the Union of Architects, and uh, unfortunately, and himself falls kind of victim of the regime in the 50s as, as the regime changes. Uh, but his classmates uh, uh, get uh, actually imprisoned by the Gulag. So Mosmanian spends uh, many, uh, after having kind of very successful careers in the, in the 20s, in, in Armenia, for example, in building things, uh, he goes to the Google Gulag and becomes uh, the chief architect of Vorkuta. So, you know, and it comes back with that as well. So it's a, it's a, you know, of course it didn't have the kind of life abroad or continuation abroad that uh, Bauhaus had. Bauhaus, of course, had not just life abroad, but any life abroad. No, no, it could Harvard and Yale and all the, and all the wonderful, wonderful uh, yeah. and very uh, key locations, but it also made it such a respects as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's well, I mean, uh, we have, I mean, that's also what this book is trying yes, to speak yes. about, like from 1919, I mean, there's also, I mean, there's a queer bar house, right? I mean, yes. that is kind of the histories, uh, like we needed 100 years, or I don't know why we needed so long, but um, <laughs> it needed that time apparently to to unearth these questions, right? And uh, to actually to bring students back and, uh, into a conversation that have been either ignored or yeah, have disappeared. And some of them were persecuted, were murdered, some of the stories are in the book, um, but also um, obviously Jewish uh, um, students who also didn't make it, some of them made it to Palestine or elsewhere. But, um, so it's full actually of tragedies, no? So I, I think also the school, the mass will also uh, have this kind of story yeah. to tell. Yeah. And we are just, it's sort of, uh, it's just, it's pedagogical project for that, for mm -hmm. that, what it is now. But there's but I think there's so much to be. Absolutely. Still, yeah, there's a huge social component. Yeah. Okay. There's a first ever, this is very important because we've had several of these hybrid events. And for the first time ever, there's a question <laughs> from <laughs> the internet. Uh, the internet question is from Maria, it's not you. No, I also have a question, but I uh, let <laughs> Well, it could be Maria but it could be it could be a number of Marias. Uh, but the question from the internet, Maria, is how do you see the importance of the basic course of the of the pedagogy of Bauhaus and of course master architecture and design teacher? So that's a question about the basic course the basic and course. its importance for architecture and design teacher in particular. I see. Should we ask maybe both Maria's questions at the same time so that we can move towards the reception? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Sure, yeah, I know. Thank you, first of all, so much for this presentation. But this is the only public book that I pre ordered, and I'm really looking forward to seeing <laughs> that. And thanks for that this conversation, really endless. Um, my question is more like it's less about kind of the historical detail that you are planning to there and the enormous model, but more about your conceptualized with that. And uh, I just watched in here from my um, teaching of research methods in the School of Design I teach. And that kind of brings me to this your title, like Abdullah and the Math. <laughs> so what exactly do you mean there? And and whether if, if you mean that's a method as a okay, it's a method of making and you can make a like method of pedagogy and um, imagine how today like first like spatial construction and then uh, then architecture modeling and these kind of things. But is this, a, is this also a matter of thinking and a matter of, kind of what we now understand more traditionally than the rest of the research methodology? Yeah? And if so, is, is this method kind of re reproducible? Can it be, be a part? And if not, why? Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. It's actually it's a great question. They're yeah. very related, yeah. and yeah, on a, on a kind of larger scale, mm -hmm. if we were to think, like I said, historiographically, uh, of education in design and architecture and arts. Uh, there is a long history of teaching which is based on the continuity of tradition from master to student or from master to apprentice, right? where the figure of the master is in, in many ways irreplaceable. It has to be this, this certain person who, who has the knowledge and he, right, this is usually he, transfers that knowledge to the student. And how somehow the man goes on, the student becomes a master. So uh, method and the spirit of avant-garde uh, attempts to sort of remove ultimately the master and replace it with the method. So the whole thing could happen kind of almost automatically in this sort of industrial way. So it's a very simple idea. And again, they're aware of it, they talk about it. And that's, that's all, even we can read it in between the lines with Rodchenko's and Lisitsky's artist as a construct of right? It's not somebody who is artist as an engineer, somebody who follows the method. It's not somebody who has uh, their own personal vision of something for no reason. Like, how do you become and this idea of being objective, something that they're obsessed with, and there's been a wonderful, you know, kind of literature and history of objectivity of the period, it's not just uh, the Soviet period by any means, and not just architecture, it's really this moment in time. That's, so that's maybe the, the kind of bigger, bigger question of uh, the answer. And then the uh, question of whether it's uh, applicable today, specifically, let's say, if we talk about uh, space course or graphics course, I would argue that. Yes, it is. Um, moreover, the reason why I was interested in it to begin with as a, let's say, an architecture student when I first saw this work is because it resonated with me in that present moment. So we need whatever it was, some decades. But, but uh, in other words, that it seemed to me that the education that I was getting at, uh, you know, wonderful uh, Bachelor of Architecture program United States, CDQs, um, where we both went. Uh, it is. It was in many ways similar or resonant with this method here, and I couldn't figure out why and how. And in fact, I would argue that contemporary architecture education is very much based on space. Is very much relying on this idea of. Um, uh, of, of studying form abstractly first, of uh, understanding morphology first, of understanding how form works, and only then, you know, beginning to uh, uh, kind of shape it relative to other more specific uh, data <laughs> of program, of site, of, of everything else, right? So in many ways, this idea that the rationalists had uh, of primacy and autonomy of form, something that as much as we maybe resist it, is actually, in, in my opinion, very much relevant and very, very sort of real to this day. So I think it's about embracing it and sort of understanding what it means and where it comes from. So uh, 
that's the reason why why I think to me it's interesting and why I think the initial comment, which was so wonderful, about how this is an architecture book, because in many ways it, it's it, it it is, you know. And um the other one with uh Rochenko, for example, in his pedagogy, I think it's absolutely you know relevant and in many ways very architectural because he's giving you instructions of how to uh actually become <laughs> become a constructivist like he's literally writing that as a kind of algorithm and so one can one can do this uh, very easily it works i mean i've tested it on everyone from uh, mm -hmm. grandparents to, to to children and it's absolutely a uh, working method whether or not one would use specifically this as a kind of oh this is a way to like we can do all of our exercises today mm -hmm. but we won't necessarily do them to to learn how to make paper stand up, right? Mm -hmm. Which is his sort of because we've, we already know that that we can do that, but we can do it to understand Albers better mm -hmm. and what his thinking is behind because he's an interesting and important figure for us historically, also. And the same with this, right? So I think this we can also approach it from this perspective. And so, in fact, when I teach uh, classes on, on both of those, it's about learning this method through making. Which is very much, uh, which is very effective. You can really actually, well, right away, your head, uh, you know, gets to the right place, and you understand the thinking behind all of those concepts much easier. So, if that's mm -hmm. both both work, I think the question of how it works today is an interesting one, a larger one, a broader one, both for discussion but in terms of historical use of it. Totally works. <laughs> Yeah, it makes the book so special when it, it, uh, it's an architect, <laughs> a designer who is uh, putting this together. And you also, I mean, you draw all the diagrams, you make your, so it's, uh, it's another document. I mean, Alfred Barr, why would we always repeat, uh, replicate his diagram? Mm -hmm. Not now we take yours. So I, <laughs> I already included it in my curriculum. <laughs> And now what we have to do is to methodically eat crisps and drink wine. <laughs> 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 <laughs>